So now in this next section, what I want to do is to say, well, what are the Christian guidelines in understanding dreams? More Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus today than ever before in dreams play and visions play an important part in that. So, just to give you an, a sense of, in the Bible, the Old and New Testament contains a lot of accounts of dreams and visions. When was the last time you heard a sermon on the dream or on visions? We in the Western culture, we just, oh yeah, that was one thing that happened, but you don't spend much time in regards to that. The Bible records a world of dreams and visions that operate as one of the legitimate channels of divine personal revelation. What was the Muslim worldview? Was it not dreams and visions were a legitimate channel of divine personal revelation? We see it within the Bible as well. The Bible does not exclude the middle. We have excluded it in our Western churches. So Joseph, he had the dream of the ladder. Gideon, he did um, the fleece and various other things to find out what was going on. Uh, Solomon, God spoke to him in a dream and said, what do you want? And Solomon said, I want um, wisdom to guide these people. Uh, the prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, uh, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, and Habakkuk all had dreams and visions. What about the New Testament? Well, did Joseph have a dream about marrying Mary? About when to leave and go to Egypt? And when to come back from Egypt? And what about the wise men? As we enter into Christmas season, they were warned in a dream not to go by the same way that they had come. Paul's conversion, it was meeting Jesus, a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus. Peter had vision. Uh, remember, he went up to the room to pray and he had the sheet come down. And in the sheet were all kinds of things that were prohibited by the Jews. And it was not just one time, it was three times this vision came. Uh, a whole book of Revelation is a dream, a vision in which God enters into the world and peels back the unseen world. This is the reality that's going on. It is not just what we experience in this world. There is things and forces that are working behind it. And the book of Revelation is the peeling back and we would be much better looking at Revelation not as a book of prophecy to the end times, but looking at it as the peeling back of this reality of the unseen world that is going on. And so many of the plagues and various other things that are mentioned in the book of Revelation are the things that have been going on since the beginning of time. It's not anything new. And we would do well in interpretation Revelation, not as a prophetic book of the end times, but as to what is happening in the unseen world. So here's a question that I think that we need to ask as Christians. Are Western Christians conditioned to relate dreams and visions to the psychological framework 
and dismiss them. Is, are our ears and our eyes blocked so that we will not listen to when God speaks? If dreams and visions are the legitimate way in which God enters into this world, are we listening? Second question. Has the Western Christian been so influenced by the scientific and rational worldview to really write off the possibility that God could speak in another way? Another question, is it possible that Western Christian biblical worldview is further from the biblical worldview than the Muslim worldview on the supernatural? And I think these are important questions to ask as well as, does God still utilize dreams and visions in communicating with mankind? Or are we dispensationalists and say, that has finished? Sorry, God, you can't continue to speak the way you've been doing. I think these are important questions that we need to ask our own selves. This study was done by Dudley Woodbury. It was, the article was, Why Muslims Follow Jesus in Christianity Today. So he interviewed 750 Muslims who had converted to Jesus in 30 countries with 50 ethnic groups. So you know it's not an isolated group. So he said, why are you coming to Christ? What was the thing that influenced you in coming to Christ? Number one was seeing the Christian faith lived out. God's love, compassion, and forgiveness, the qualities of the Christian marriage, marriages. If our Christian life is only lived out in church and at home, and when we leave and we enter the secular world, we leave our Christian identity back there and go into a secular worldview no one will see the Christian faith lived out. We have separated our lives into compartments. And in so doing, we have cut off evangelism and being salt and light in this world. Second one was the power of answered prayer. So pray boldly. I'll give you just an indication in regards to this. Uh, as far as for the other ones about living out in the Christian marriages. Uh, I have had people just sort of say, the, the Christians have marriages that we don't have and we don't see. And I think we need to invite people into our homes. They need to see what a Christian really does. And that is not just for Islam, it's for everybody. They need to see it. I was really, I was impressed by their neighbors and when one of the kids said, uh, the dog was scared of me and he says, oh, no. Roy, he's a really nice guy. You know, he's a really, really nice guy. You know, you don't have to be afraid of him. You know, he just went on and talked about my praises. So, I mean, you've got to live out on the street so that people can see it. 
for me, it was like, okay, there's more than a nice guy. There's a reason behind it. But the other one was power prayer. Uh, our neighbor, he had fallen uh, and he fell off a ladder and he was trying to replace a light bulb. He put the ladder at a wrong angle. So rather than putting it where all of the pressure goes down to the legs, he had it this way. So when he went on it, it went boom. So he wrenched his back, he couldn't go to work. He and uh, the kids had told me about what was going on. So I went over and talked to him. And so I put my arm around him and I said, Nudge, can I pray for you? He said, sure, go ahead. So I prayed for him in Jesus' name. I prayed that he would, that Jesus would reveal himself, that he would be able to know Jesus the way that I know him, because I know that he doesn't know you. Um, so I, I prayed for, I said, you are the one who heals. You are the one who sees. Uh, and healing really comes for you. And I pray, Lord God, Jesus, that you would touch, nudge my, my dear friend. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. So I go home. Half an hour later, he comes by and uh, I come out of the house. And he says, do you remember when you prayed for me? It's only been a half an hour. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I remember when I prayed for you. We said, well, when you prayed for me, you put your hand around me and you started praying. And he said, then I felt this pain just shooting down my back. And I said, Lord Jesus, what did I do? <laughs> and I'm so sorry, Lord, you know, why? I was trying to do something positive. <laughs> and then he did this. He reached down and said, I can do this. So I looked at him and said, Nush, Jesus is more than a prophet. From that point on, I could share the gospel with him and his family members. Uh, they invited me to their homes for all kinds of stuff, uh, for birthdays and celebrations and stuff like this, and was able to honestly do this. But again, it was the power of God entering into this world. My cousin up in Minneapolis says, Roy, you've got the gift of healing. I go, no. <laughs> but I prayed boldly, and God answered. Uh, a third one is why the people, uh, Muslims came to know Christ, was hearing and reading the gospel and that the life of Jesus was so attractive. I'm doing a Bible study with a guy from Iran. And he said, at first, I was just captured by Jesus. And now as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount and other passages, he goes, wow, this is teaching me differently of how to live. But the words of scripture just speak volumes. So let's not just talk about the Bible. Let's pick it up and read it. And that's one of the things that I have done from the very beginning of uh, my evangelism was not talk about the scriptures, but I carry the Bible with me and I would just say, well, this is what the Bible says. And I'd have the person read it. Uh, I was doing that with this one guy here and we were talking about something and I knew where in the Bible it said that. So I just flipped to the Bible and had him read it and he goes, this book is different than any other religious book. It speaks to us today about what is important to us. So let's be bold and use the scriptures. Here's an interesting thing. Of the ones who had dreams and visions, was 25% of the 70, 750 people had a dream or a vision. Of the ones who had the dreams and vision, 40% of them had it before conversion, 45 post-conversion. Let's pray for dreams. I can remember the first time this had happened to me. It was, uh, I was picking up a guy, uh, he was a refugee. Uh, it was a really bad situ situation with all kinds of refugees from around the world. And he just was like a fish out of water, as we say. And so much evil was happening in the refugee camp. And then you went outside and it was where the drug and the prostitutions was taking place in the city. But 
he said, I had a dream. Can you interpret the dream for me? <laughs> Remember, dream interpretation was important. <laughs> and I was a religious person, so he was asking me. And I just said, you know, I have not taken a course in seminary called dream interpretation. <laughs> and I was scared. I was like, oh my goodness, how am I supposed to interpret, you know, the colors and other things and things like this that are supposed to be within dreams. And I didn't even know that back then. So he told me this. He said he was walking down the street with this really bad section of town. And there before him stood a man in white. Remember the colors. He could see the details of his robes, but his face he couldn't see. It was flu, but it shined. He knew it was a religious person, but he knew it was Jesus. He talked to him and said that your situation that you are now living in will not last long. Be patient. You will soon be out of this. And then he identified himself and said, he was standing in a sea of water, just water all around. So then he identified him and said, I am the living water. So I said, do you want to know who this is? <laughs> this one is easy to interpret. <laughs> Take him to John, woman at the well, and Jesus talks about the living water and say, I am the living water. I said, it is Jesus that spoke to you. He never came to know Christ, but he came to all our Bible studies and everything. Uh, uh, he knew what was going on. So what are the guidelines for dream interpretation? Number one, Understand that all dreams are not necessarily from God. I had this one guy who had Muslims say that they had a dream of Jesus, but they also had a dream of Muhammad. And so I mean, there's this confusion. But understand that all dreams are not from God. Number two, confirm that the dream doesn't conflict with what the Bible says. So in interpreting dreams, consult with followers of Jesus about the dream rather than other people. Discern the purpose and character of the dream. What is it trying to say? And nurture, does the dream nurture a willingness to obey God? These are important. legitimate visitations of Jesus, what did they look like? The dreams must support the promises contained in the Word of God. It's taken from Dole's book on dreams and visions. Re the person who has a dream of Jesus remembers the experience complete with concrete details. Do you remember what I said about the guy? The details were so vivid for him. It was the realization that the dream of Jesus had a purpose. And for him, he knew that there was a purpose to the dream. It wasn't just a dream. Realize that a new order is in store. And with the dream that I told you about, there was definitely a new order that's coming. And it brings definition to their life and it becomes a part of their testimony. It was so impactful that this is what happened. So my question is, has mysticism and the belief of the union with the absorption into a deity or the absolute or the spiritual apprehension of knowledge inaccessible to the intellect may be attained through contemplation and self-surrender. Has this entered our Christian faith? This is a dream, or this is a poetry of a Muslim 
by the name of Rumi, and every Muslim knows this. So it goes, hearken to this reed forlorn, which means myself. I'm the reed. Breathing ever since t'was torn, he came to birth, from its rusty bed, a strain of incompassion, love, and pain. The secret of my song, though near, none can see and none can hear. Oh, for a friend to know the sign and to mingle all his soul with mine. Tis the flame of love that fired me. Tis the wine of love inspired me. Wouldst thou learn how lovers bleed? Hearken, hearken, hearken to this reed. Could a Christian sing this song? This is a popular Christian song. Is there anything in this that a Muslim could not sing? Draw me closer. It's, it's sounding very close to the Rumi, right? Draw me closer to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again. I hear you say that I'm your friend. Wasn't it what Rumi said as well? You are my desire. No one else will do. Cause nothing else can take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. You're the fire. You're the love, is what Rumi said. You're all I want. You're all I ever need. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. What's interesting with this song is we don't have to hearken God. God hearkens us. Mm -hmm. In the Sufi understanding, you're trying to draw God to you. You have to wake him and you have to bring him. And that is what this song is doing as well. So we've come to an end. This will be put on a video. This is our channel, um, just to let you know. But uh, this gives you an understanding of this whole realm in that uh, maybe our worldview needs to change a little bit.